My talk today is going to talk about um, the political and journalistic aspects of Dia de los Muertos. And this research comes out of, as, as the, you heard earlier, a book that I wrote called Day of the Dead in the USA. And this book was actually, um, when I was a doctoral student at UC San Diego, this was my dissertation topic. And I actually started the research in 1999, and the book got published in 2009. So that was 10 years of research and um, going to all kinds of Dia de los Muertos events um, all over California and interviewing about 100 people. A lot of them were foundational Chicano art, Chicana and Chicano artists who were uh, instrumental in starting the, the celebrations of Dia de los Muertos that we know today, things like this that happen in universities and schools and museums and things like this. Um, so, okay, I, I guess I don't have to point this, do I? Okay, yeah. Um, so, you know, these types of events that we see today in schools and universities and museums and art galleries, if you went back 50 years ago in the United States, you wouldn't see these types of things. The Dia de los Muertos celebrations that we are familiar with today in terms of having altar making with multi-tiered altars and, and the sugar skulls and the pan de muerto, the sempasuchil, these types of celebrations weren't happening in the United States. Uh, the Mexican-American community and other Latino communities did observe November 1 and 2, but they did so in very different ways than what we're seeing today. The Dia de los Muertos celebrations that we see today really come out of the Chicano movement um, of the 1960s and 70s. The Chicano movement, for those of you, I think most of you probably know what that was, but it was a movement uh, also known as the Movimiento. It was a movement, a uh, social justice movement of Mexican Americans struggling for civil rights. And the movement had its roots in the Mexican farm workers' struggles of the 1930s, but it really continued the, the organizing work, the civil rights work continued, and by the 1960s and 70s, it had really burgeoned, and, it, and the movement continued after that and continues in different ways today. So the Chicano movement was struggling for all kinds of basic civil rights for the Mexican-American community here in, in, in California, in Texas, in the Southwest, and other areas where you had the, large uh, populations of Mexicans and other Latinos. And basically, it's hard to, to maybe for some young people to, to realize or understand that in California, in Texas, in the Southwest, um, the life for, for people of Mexican ancestry in this area was similar in many ways to life for African Americans in the Deep South. There were segregated schools, segregated housing, um, inferior services of all kinds. Um, inferior job opportunities, job training opportunities. There were restaurants and hotels and buildings that would have signs, no blacks, no Mexicans, no Indians. So this was kind of the climate that had gone on for decades and decades. The Chicano movement was fighting against this type of situation. And they were fighting for civil rights, for integrated housing, integrated schools, farm workers' rights and other labor rights. Um, obviously, uh, Native American land rights, voting and political <coughs> rights. and bilingual education, which of course prior to the 70s, bilingual education was not uh, really, something that was not really done in the United States very much. But part of the larger um, activist agenda for the Chicanas and Chicanos that were active in the movement was also the public celebration of Mexican traditions. Again, in those times, the multicultural sort of atmosphere that we have in universities today wasn't the situation. It was very much of an Anglo-dominated curriculum, and so you did not have Kwanzaa celebrations and um, Diwali celebration of lights and all the interesting Cinco de Mayo, all the things that young people today do get exposure to, like this wonderful event today. So basically, at the time, um, you know, young Chicanas and Chicanos who were maybe they were artists or they were bilingual teachers or they were educators and activists, a lot of them were trying to be able to bring the, the, the beauty of the culture and, and celebrate it in a very public way, whereas before it had been kind of by the mainstream, Anglo culture had been kind of, not just kind of, but not really uh, considered to be valuable or worth celebrating. So um, at the same time, that you have the Chicana and Chicano sort of activists doing civil rights struggles and trying to bring um, more pride, more acknowledgement, more public visibility to Mexican traditions and cultures and celebrations. You also had, uh, you know, for decades, the climate in the U.S. media was one in which uh, Mexican people of Mexican ancestry and other Latinx populations were marginalized in the mainstream news media, TV, 
um, movies at that time when you saw people who were from Latino communities at all it was more often if there was news coverage it was more often crime related news coverage there were very they were underrepresented in everything from you know but <coughs> whether it was uh, situation comedies or, or soap operas, uh, any kind of TV shows that were popular media, underrepresented, negatively represented, misrepresented. And so because, and, and at the last point here is that due to racism, a lot of mainstream newspapers did not hire uh, journalists who, uh, who were from Latinx communities. And so you had a situation where people tried to say, well, how are we gonna get our points across? And one of the things that happened is um, they really, that the Chicanos and Chicanos developed their own alternative media, media forms and other ways to communicate. And so among these forms were things like street theater, um, such as Teatro Campesino, which was a wonderful street, it still, still is a wonderful um, theater group that did public uh, presentations of theater that often had really political themes in them. Also music, film, literature, public murals, spoken word events, such as the, the, maybe some of you heard of the Taco Shop Poets, which is a sort of more recent um, kind of spoken word, um, Chicana and Chicano uh, poetry troupe, but also through political art. And so these were alternative forms of communication that helped the, the people here, the, the Chicana and Chicano community here to not only communicate the culture and identity, public recognition of the contributions of the community that had were part of the fabric of California here, but also often political messages as well regarding segregation, regarding um, you know, farm worker rights, labor rights, et cetera. So as part of the Chicano and Chicano um, you know, activism that was happening here at the time, there was also a cultural reclamation that was going on in the late 60s, early 70s. At that time, a lot of, the 1970s was, as you know, a time of a lot of political activism where you had everything from African American civil rights movements, the women's movement, anti-Vietnam War protests, environmentalists starting to really organize in a big way. It was a time, exciting time of activism. And so among that, you also had a lot of people going back to their, people who had grown up in the United States who, because they had grown up here, uh, were often severed from ancestral traditions. And so you had some people who were African-American who'd go to Africa to study maybe African music, weaving, languages, et cetera. You had Italian-Americans going back to Italy to try and learn Italian. And you had a lot of young um, Chicanas and Chicanos who also were traveling to Mexico to study different ancestral traditions that they had not grown up with here due to dynamics of immigration, colonization, et cetera, they um, were not as familiar with some of the traditions that they would perhaps have been exposed to had they grown up in Mexico. So a number of Chicano and Chicano uh, activists, artists, teachers traveled to Mexico, to Southern Mexico especially, and they were studying you know, things like um, the, the Mexican dancing or different indigenous, indigenous languages or weaving, um, you know, all kinds of art forms. And among the things that they were looking at when they went to Southern Mexico, were, they, they started to observe the Dia de los Muertos celebrations that are done by the indigenous peoples uh, in various areas of Southern Mexico. And so what they saw was a way of celebrating and remembering the ancestors on November 1st and 2nd that was in some ways similar and in some ways really different than the things they had grown up with. So when I interviewed um, people who, uh, Chicano and Chicano artists, who had been instrumental in bringing the celebration to the United States in the early 70s, they told me things like that in their homes when they were growing up, they would certainly go to the cemetery, they would have, uh, maybe they'd go to mass, they'd have a family meal, they would uh, bring flowers to the cemetery, and maybe have a picnic in the cemetery, but what they weren't doing growing up in the States were making these multi-tiered altars with laden with harvest symbolism, all the types of flowers and fruits and 
food offerings that they saw when they went to southern Mexico. Um, so they saw altars like this. This is a photo I took of a family from, they're a Mixtec family from Oaxaca, and this is their kitchen. And you can see the altar, uh, you've seen the, like the beautiful altar here in this room and the one at the art gallery. Traditionally in a lot of um, areas of southern Mexico, they will have, or indigenous people throughout Mexico, they will have these types of altars with these beautiful flowers, food offerings. And so when Chicanos and Chicanos saw this type of thing, they were really touched by the, the beauty of this way of the color, the beauty, and the sugar skulls, the pan de muerto, and they wanted to bring this to the United States. And so they did that. They brought these celebrations to the, 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 two, the first two um, documented places that we know of that had public Dia de los Muertos celebrations that were secular and public and done in a very you know public way happened in uh, a, Chicana, a Chicano art gallery called um, Self Help Graphics in Los Angeles and the same, this was 1972 and the same year there was also simultaneously a Dia de los Muertos exhibition altar exhibition in uh, an art a Chicano art gallery in San Francisco called um, Galeria de la Raza and so basically this, they, this is the form that you would see in family uh, situations, family homes in Mexico. But in the United States, they, um, they, these altars became altar installations created by artists as a way to celebrate, not only to remember their personal family members who would have passed away recently, but also to celebrate the, the identity, the Me Mexican American identity, the culture, and um, the larger, it ended up being, uh, uh, something that was celebrating the larger um, Latino community as well. But so, as I was saying, these art altars or ofrendas that had traditionally been done inside people's homes, inside their families, began to be um, these installations done by, alt by, by artists in the United States. And they often look like this, take up an entire room, um, have photos that were recent um, members of the family deceased, but also s uh, elements of the culture like the Virgin of Guadalupe, or um, different types of um, elements that represented the Chicano experience here in the United States, as well as the Mexican sort of uh, ancestral cultural traditions, both indigenous and Catholic. So from the 1970s onward, Dia de los Muertos became one of the most important spiritual and political symbols of the Chicano movement. And not only did this become a way, uh, a sort of an alternative medium through the idea of having these public um, altars in museums and galleries and in, in schools and parks and libraries, this really public celebration was not, not only just about honoring people's individual relatives, but also honoring the, ans the ancestral collective sort of collective ancestors of Mexican and other Latinx populations. So in the United States, there began to be altars for people like Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, Che Guevara, um, Maria Felix, the famous Mexican actress, or Pedro Infante. Um, and later you saw altars for people like Cesar Chavez, or um, you know, most recently uh, Celia Cruz, or Tito Puente. So it, it ended up being something that was started honoring Mexican um, sort of collective ancestors, but then later over the years has <coughs> developed into a way to honor not only the collective ancestors of Latinos in this country, but also then it's, it's really been embraced by so many people from different races and ethnicities and people use this as a way to honor all kinds of, of people. Um, and so as we, we've seen in this beautiful exhibit here behind me, which I hope you'll all check out if you haven't had a chance to, to see it, um, Jose Guadalupe Posada uh, is somebody that a lot of us have you know, many people in the States are familiar with his, his caricatures. He was a, um, a, he did, he was a lithographer who did political, um, often satirical cartoons in, in newspapers. And I know that we're gonna hear more about that very soon from my fellow panelists. There was a, um, a, a history of satirical poetry that was happening um, for All Souls Day in Mexico. And it also, um, there was a history that really goes back to um, European traditions of the poetry that was done. Um, it, it was called, there was actually it was drama, poetry, music, art, known as Danza Macabre. And these were um, sort of supposed to be humorous uh, po representations of death to make people think about life. And so here's one, just an example that was from um, a German. Um, Michael Wolgamott, 1493. You can see some of the, the skeletal imagery here. 
This was very popular in the 15, 16, 17, 1800s, 1850, 60s, 70s, in um, you know, many countries in Europe, especially France. And since at that time, in the late 1800s, many of the elite in Mexico or the well-educated people looked to France oftentimes for their um, sort of fashion and trendiness. This was also very popular in Mexico. And these poems, these satirical poems were known as calaveras. I know in Guatemala they have a similar tradition where they make um, the satirical poetry on November 1 and 2 every single year. They call those poems bombas, and I've been told by people in El Salvador that they also have a similar tradition where they also call them bombas. So um, that's something that I learned in my research. But so let's move a little bit forward. So starting really with Chicano, Ch Chicano and Chicana artists and you know continuing on to the present day, you see all kinds of political messages in Day of the Dead altars. Because these altars were one of the ways they changed from the Mexican traditional family context to the US context as they became, as I was saying, more secular, more public, and they began to be forms of political communication where you could remember people who died because of preventable socioeconomic, sociopolitical causes. And so you start to see with the Chicano and Chicano artists, they began to make altars that were honoring farm workers who were dying because of pesticide poisoning, or you know, young people dying in gang violence, or um, women being murdered in, in domestic and partner violence. And you saw altars for people dying of AIDS, altars related to immigration. To this day, when you look at um, altars, you'll see altars for all kinds of human rights abuses. I know that the altar in the gallery here that, that some of you all helped to make, uh, it, it remembers environmentalists in Latin America who were killed just because they were defending their lands and defending their environment. So today, we see altars that have all kinds of political messages. And so the altar becomes this, this communication medium, a very visible, public communication medium for getting people to think about these sort of preventable socioeconomic and sociopolitical reasons that people are dying every day when they don't, they shouldn't have to be dying in this way. So to give you some examples of how these altars take on the very different looks oftentimes in the United States, this is an altar done at the Oakland Museum of California, and it was remembering young people in Oakland who had been killed by gang violence. They also had photos of Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shapur on there, but they also decided to put um, a, an album cover of Bob Marley because they wanted him on there as a peace activist, but basically the altar had some handouts people could take with them and read the statistics on how many young people were being murdered by gang violence and gun violence in Oakland that year. So this is just one example of many, many altars you'll see in California and throughout the United States that take on these political, honoring people who have died, and it's really bringing attention to these political issues. Um, really quickly, I'm gonna just go through, this is an altar that is in honor of farm workers, and instead of the traditional types of um, mole or, or um, you know, other types of foods, that tamales that would be on an altar back in Mexico, they have um, the types of fruits that farm workers pick. So you see, banana, you see uh, lettuce, strawberries, potatoes, uh, tomatoes, the types of things that farm workers pick. And this altar also had handouts, things on the walls and handouts that explain to you the exploitation of farm workers in this country. Um, this is an altar that I went to um, on, this is an interesting, this is the border with El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. And so it was an altar that was divided in two by the border fence. And this was the US side, the El Paso side. The other side, the altar continued, and it was the Mexican side. And this altar was remembering people who had died in the deserts trying to cross over, drawing attention to US foreign policy, the, the failure of, 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 of US uh, immigration policies, and trying to get people to think of the human toll, the human death toll of what's going on, using Dia de los Muertos as a way to get people to think and remember these dead that are too easily forgotten. Um, here's one I went to in LA. It was a, um, this was a protest on Day of the Dead when the United States began to um, invade Afghanistan. A lot of young um, Latino high school, high school kids and college kids organized this march against the war. And um, they were also creating these altars that were commemorating um, the, young, the, the large amount of, of young people that were getting killed in the war. And especially they had flyers drawing attention to the disproportionate number of Latino and black youth that get uh, um, 
drafted, or, or not drafted, but you know, invited to join the military. And they, they end up in, joining the military in higher numbers than other races, and oftentimes end up experiencing casualties when they're there. So this altar was, this particular altar was made for Jesus Suarez del Solar, who was um, the first American to be killed in the Afghanistan war. But they also had photos of other young people who had been um, killed in that, in that fight. So uh, just examples, and you can see how the students who made this altar, they're making very clear connections between the reasons for this war and US foreign policy, US interest in oil in the Middle East, et cetera. So these are just some examples of the many types of ways that Day of the Dead in this country is used for these political causes. Here's a, a Day of the Dead march um, against violence against women here. And um, this is one from a couple of years ago in New York City. It was drawing attention to that year there had been, um, you know, every year in Mexico, Mexico is one of the worst countries in the world for journalists, along with Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, but you know, Mexico is like right now really have very high levels of journalists being murdered for doing their jobs, for writing about corruption, for writing about drug trafficking, et cetera. And this was an altar that had this TV screen that was changing every you know, few minutes to show you another photo of another journalist who had been murdered that day, uh, that year in Mexico. So um, these are just, again, the, the basic uh, ways in which the Day of the Dead in the United States has really become a communication medium that goes far beyond simply the, the cultural and familial communication to actually encompass political communication as well. And um, it's a way to talk about Latino identity, Latino politics, and it's also provided opportunities for front page news. Because these celebrations are so colorful, they often get front page news, um, and you have newspapers like this who prior to the 1970s were pretty much ignoring the Latinx community in the United States. Like I said, it would mainly be coverage, coverage of crime or whatever, but there wasn't a lot of coverage. But then you have mainstream newspapers like this and other news organizations, TV, radio, that are covering Day of the Dead now. And you see uh, front page stories on November 1st and 2nd. You'll surely see some, if you look at newspapers in a couple of days, that are basically having a lot of attention to Day of the Dead as this, this really major event. And that attention um, is not just cultural attention, but it, first it draws people to want to come to these events, to want to learn more about these events. But in the actual articles themselves, they often cover political themes. So here's a, here's a more recent, um, this is the Oakland North uh, website. And there's an article here, Oakland Day of the Dead Altar, Shed Light on Political Issues. And um, this is another one from a uh, website called Feministing, and it's like, Dia de los Muertos is political, and if you go on there, they talk about the ways that Day of the Dead is raising attention to people in, about, about political issues. Um, and then, of course, you've got all kinds of media now today that's covering Day of the Dead, and this is, again, exposure. It's, it's, it's helping people to get, it's giving um, the Latinx community, Mexi Mexican and Latinx community, greater visibility in the mainstream culture and often helping to open up space at the table for people to be having more say, more input into the political process as well. Um, so just to wrap up my, I think this is the last slide here. Um, this is uh, the key points of, of, of my book is that construction of Latinx identity, pride and collective memory all happen through Day of the Dead in the United States. Uh, it's also a way to raise political consciousness within and beyond the Latinx community and um, it's very much impacted mainstream U.S. society. It's gained greater visibility for U.S. Mexicans and other Latinx populations, helping to enlarge the political the space at the table, so to speak. There's still a long way to go, but this is one way, one communication form that has helped gain visibility, not only for the community, but also for political issues affecting the Latino community and all of us. So, okay, thank you. Um. So I'd like to take this opportunity to remind all of us that we are on Kumeyaay land. And I think often when people say that, they forget that Kumeyaay land transcends the border. The Kumeyaay people live both north and south of the U.S.-Mexico border. And back in the early 70s, when Chicanos and Chicanas gathered at the Centro Cultural de la Raza um, and took to heart the words of El Plan Espiritual de Aslan, which said we're all indigenous, we're all uh, native to this hemisphere, our ancestors are native to this hemisphere. One of the first questions they asked is, well, what the hell does that mean? And so what they did was they sought out the elders here in North County, San Diego, as well as south of the border. And 
Um, I'd like to take this opportunity during the, the week of Dia de los Muertos to acknowledge Teodora Cuero, a Kumeyaay Indian leader from La Huerta in Baja California. She was very close to uh, people that uh, were involved with the Centro Cultural de la Raza, especially the Enrique family. Um, so Lindy gave me instructions here. I, is it right click? Oh, on the side over here, okay. Okay, so I also want to um, give a little shout out to um, Pedro Linares. This is a portrait I did of him and on the uh, left a um, sculptural version of one of Jose Guadalupe Posada's uh, prints. This was for an altar I made for them a number of years ago. Uh, Linares was spoken about last night and people talked about his early alebrijes and, his, and the later alebrijes. And one of his earliest ones is on the left. And you can see the difference in technique uh, between it and the one on the right. I just wanted people who were here last night to get a chance to see what people were talking about. Uh, Leonardo um, Linares, his grandson, was saying that uh, there was a difference between the techniques his father was using with the alebrijes and the ones that his grandfather, Pedro, was using. But they're pretty wacky, huh? So how many people here under the age of 30 have ever had a fever dream? How many people here have had a fever dream? OK. So if you have parents that gave you aspirin, you don't get fever dreams. Um, but if you have parents that pass along the wisdom of, well, you just sweat it out. You just stay in bed and you sweat it out. Um, that's when you get fever dreams. And uh, supposedly uh, Pedro Linares um, had a fever dream and that, that was the result. These alebrijes were the result of that. So I just wanted to bring um, both El Diablo and uh, Akalaka back to uh, campus back in 1977. The Tenaz Festival was held here on campus, uh, wow. was hosted. You didn't know that? No, um, and that's a national uh, Chicano theater group, an international group, actually. Um, and this was a poster I did. I did the illustration, Sal Barajas I did the, uh, the design. And it's important to, to, for me to keep in mind that uh, there is this mix, there is this syncretism, uh, which Regina Markey calls syncretism, between um, indigenous sensibilities, indigenous spiritual philosophies, and Roman Catholicism. And the 2nd of November in the Catholic liturgical calendar is All Souls Day. It's when devout Catholics go to um, church and pray for the quick release of the souls that are burning in purgatory. Does is purgatory still exist? Because I quit going to church uh, in 65, and <laughs> my sister, who is a, a nun, a, a, a member of the congregation of St. Joseph of Carandolet, tells me that, you know, like I'm about two generations behind now. <laughs> but is purgatory you still a reality? Is, is uh, purgatory still a reality? Yeah, okay, so All Souls Day is a day you do your duty, go, go to church and pray for the quick recovery. These are paintings, the one on top painted in 1973 and then repainted in 2012, uh, primarily by Yermo Aranda, uh, which depict, I thought, you know, I originally used to think, well, they're in hell, but maybe not. Maybe they're in purgatory. Uh, not only the uh, Spanish conquistadores, but the... Um, member of the San Diego Police Department. And uh, think about them uh, on All Souls Day. You might want to give them a shout out too. So this has to do with journalism and Day of the Dead and death. Um, so I was working with a group of students at UCSD as an undergrad back in the 70s. And we, uh, a Vietnam veteran by the name of Arnulfo Casillas, uh, Purple Heart veteran. May he rest in peace. Uh, wanted to start a newspaper. We decided to call it Vos Fronteriza. And this little character here, depicted in one of Jose Guadalupe Posada's um, wonderfully animated graphics. And you can see the people here are actually selling sugar skulls and items for display in people's homes. So this, is, this would have been done 
around the turn of the century. So this little character, um, hawking his wares, became part of the logo of Os Fronterisa, the original one. You see it there. Excuse me, you see the full tabloid there on the left. Um, when students were demanding education as a right, not a privilege. And then some years later, the uh, masthead was redone, thank goodness, because it's a lot more, got a lot more impact, but they kept uh, the Calavera. So I'm very pleased to see my uh, colleague from California State University, San Marcos, Dr. Anibal Yanez Chavez, who um, is my go-to guy when it comes to um, everything Mexican and everything Spanish because soy bien pocho. So this, he, t he, one of the things that, when I told him I was going to be on this panel, one of the things that he was very uh, excited about was uh, in impressing upon me that Calaveras were political texts. They're a literary form. And so I happened to come across uh, some materials that I gathered back in the 70s. You can see Jimmy Carter and um, Jose Lopez Portillo at the bargaining table. Um, this was during the U.S. energy crisis, during uh, an increased uh, recognition of immigration as an issue. And this is one of the uh, calaveras. You can see it in Spanish and then in English. And the, the drawing really fascinated me. It showed this monstrous form at the border in the background Uncle Sam as a, as a Calavera, and then the Ku Klux Klan, along with the military. And back in 1978, I think it was, yeah, 1978, David Duke, he's still around, bouncing around, uh, and uh, a guy by the name of Tom Metzger from North County, showed up uh, wearing their uh, Klan outfits for uh, photo opportunities and announced that they were going to aid the U.S. Border Patrol in apprehending undocumented workers at the border. So this is what this is referring to. And I was particularly, uh, uh, I noted in particular that it, it stated, uh, it had Chicanos on one of the heads that was being scooped up. Uh, possibly a recognition of Chicano efforts to stand up and insist that the community would defend itself in the face of any uh, white racism. This is another one. I, I loved it because it was great. It showed, this was, so this is from back in the early 80s. And it shows um, someone delivering traditionally baked bread. And you can see a photograph that was supplied by Anibal. Thank you, great photo. That would have been in the 40s. And this was done in the 50s, I mean in the 80s. And you can see the tension between uh, transnationals and the introduction of products that um, uh, made things tough for folks who, tr who were trying to keep their tradition, traditions. Um, and that goes on today. These are some cartoons, one uh, in 2011 at the top, and the one on the lower one was uh, this Sunday in the paper. And it's talking about that, that mezcla, that mix, that overlap, that, uh, hey, how do you keep track of what's what here? You know, I like your costume, it's so trendy. Costume, you know. And then up above, great costume, what are you supposed to be? So this, um, you know, life is always in dynamic balance. And one of the things that Regina does very well in her book is point out the tension and dialogue and debate that goes on, goes on between traditionalists and innovators. You saw the innovators with the um, reggae album cover, uh, the, the altar made, and then in the back you saw the graffiti art. Um, that tension is what keeps cultures alive. So this, um, this goes way back, 84. Uh, I entered an ex exhibition in San Diego called small, small uh, images. And I entered a photograph, uh, or actually a photocopy, of a morgue shot of a man by the name of um, Francisco Sanchez, who was shot to death by the Border Patrol on December 8, 1980. 
Uh, let me see if, any, if that date resonates with anybody here. Uh, so I, I decided I was going to enter it into the exhibit and I was going to put as its title, Portrait of Francisco Sanchez, Shot to Death by the Border Patrol on December 8, 1980, so that if nothing else, the people that came to see the exhibition and took the time to read the title card would get that message. So the, it was the idea of communicating the message as title card. Um, the exhibition was reviewed by Mark Elliott Lugo, wonderful guy. Um, but he had this to say about the piece. It, was, it has a disturbing craftsy look and it's too stiff and structured. In any event, the power of Portrait of Francisco Sanchez is in its message and Avalos certainly gets that across enough for Miller, who was a juror in this uh, juried exhibition, to have honored it with a $150 juror's award. So sometimes as artists, uh, you do things and you don't know what's going to happen with them. You don't know where it's going to take you. And this, um, and here you have, have a close-up, and you can see, imagine there's no countries. Did anybody nail the date, December 8th, 1980, as a date that another foreign national was shot to death with a handgun? Yeah, yeah. May they both rest in peace. So how many of you, and I want you to be absolutely honest with everybody here, I've actually sat on the Tijuana donkey cart and had your photograph taken. <laughs> For those of you who didn't raise your hand, shame on you. <laughs> get down there and get it done, okay? You'll be part of history. Anyway, this has got to be from the 50s or something. I don't know. You can probably figure out the make, from, make of the car. But these things are, are wonderfully preposterous. Here you are. Uh, Tijuana is probably the second largest city on the west coast of the hemisphere. And you've got this donkey that isn't really a, uh, I mean, you've got this donkey painted up as a zebra, and then you've got this cart that can't go anywhere because it's jacked up on wooden horses. <laughs> and then you, and, and please, you don't want it rolling around while these folks are having their photograph taken. So I decided to make a piece that commemorated the situation of the, of unauthorized immigrant labor. Uh, that's a piece I did on the right. And when uh, Amalia Mesa Bain saw it, a Chicano artist from San Francisco, she said, oh, it's an altar. And I had never thought of it, but, you know, it's all those steps are there. Uh, so, and on the back of the piece, it's a sculpture you can walk around at 360 degrees, is that image that... Um, my good friend Mark Elliott Lugo thought was a little bit too crafty and crafty and stiff. Um, so it was a way of getting me to the point where when I was invited by Lynn Schutte to participate in a public art event, because this is a gallery piece, I decided I would make a life-size version of it, and there it is. Uh, it was immediately removed uh, by the order of federal district court judge, Gordon Thompson, and which was good because it was, it was pretty shoddy. Uh, structurally, it was sound because my dad was a wharf builder and I learned how to put things together so they didn't fall apart. Uh, but the painting was, you know, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't my greatest. So when the judge ordered it removed, it was like, wow, that's like the best thing that could have happened to him. <laughs> Because of my work with the Committee on Chicano Rights um, and my working with Herman Baca and, and people like Ralph and Zooms, they're really media savvy folks. I realized that if I placed that, I had, and I had permission to have it there for two weeks, temporary. If I placed it there in front of the courthouse, um, it would be within the people working at the INS, which was the equivalent of ICE um, at the time, would be able to look out of their office windows and see this thing and it would tick them off and they would complain and it would make its way into the media and I would be able to again have an opportunity to talk about unauthorized immigrant labor. Um, but the judge did me one better and, and I was called up by the building manager who gave me a call and he said, hey, uh, could you come and remove your artwork? And I said, really? 
He said, yeah, you know, Judge Gordon Thompson has ordered it removed. I said, well, um, did he put that in writing? Yes, he did. Well, do you mind if I went down and picked it up just to see for myself? Sure, come on down. <laughs> so I immediately distributed it to the media contacts that I had learned about working with a committee on Chicano rights. And as you can see, it, it became a bit of a, a story. Uh, so something, so in a desperate effort to fit into the parameters of the panel, something to do with death and journalism, <laughs> I give you the donkey cart. I'm, I'm, how many minutes do I have left? Four more minutes. Okay, let's see what I can do here in four minutes. So, what, uh, one of the things about the uh, donkey cart is that I realized that there was a community of people around me, not only Chicanas and Chicanos, but lawyers, uh, non-Chicanas and Chicanos who were artists, uh, uh, professors, academicians, who saw the injustice of what was going on and having that piece removed. And I realized, wow, there's a whole community of us. So that piece became a, a ritual, a ceremony of mutual recognition and mutual civic participation. And this uh, poster from the Oceanside, uh, Dia de los Muertos, this was the fifth one, so it was about 2005. Uh, these aren't my words, I, the, the woman who wrote them is, is at the end, but uh, it's about Dia de los Muertos an occasion to celebrate the lives and memories of deceased ancestors and loved ones. Actually, I'm, I'm not that comfortable with that, with that description. I think it's an opportunity for people to realize there is no separation between life and death. There is no separation. And not talking about it doesn't make it so. Um, for the last five years, Main Street Oceanside has held a Dia de los Muertos celebration in downtown Oceanside. Here you see the uh, Cepasuchiles, beautifully arranged. And again here, the event features many vendors selling items such as ethnic gifts and accessories, home decor, clothing and toys. The focus of the festival is the many ofrendas built by local Oaxacan families, artists, and students. So the traditional altar that you saw, that uh, Regina showed, you, showed us all just a moment ago, uh, you can see elements of, of that here, but here what this uh, altar is promoting is respect for the rights of indigenous people. And I think when uh, Regina talks about that tension between innovators and the traditionalists, you can't get more traditional than Oaxacans. And yet here they are involved with a festival that's got mariachis, uh, uh, ballet folklorico, and you know, and everything else you can think of, f with a very strong intention of social engagement and civic engagement to promote their political rights. And um, my time's up, right? Well, I, I don't want to cut you off. I don't want to be the person that stands between. That's your job. That's your job, Dr. Tulis. Okay. One minute? One minute. Let me just, uh, okay. This was an event at Oceanside, I mean at the uh, California Center for the Arts in Escondido. Victor Ochoa uh, put this together with the help of a woman lowrider. This is a tribute to uh, a revered Aztec dancer, uh, Asleca, as part of that exhibition. And here you can see a close up. Um, one of the traditions for Aztec dancers is that every year they have to create their own vestuario. And uh, you see examples of the vestuarios, the things that he wore, that he created over the years. This was by uh, Ned Emmings. Lived with his grandmother in England for a while. He wanted to do something that had numerous steps. His grandmother taught him how to knit. So he knit this scarf. She taught him about high tea, and he wanted to remember her 
by using the skills, using his own body to replicate what she had taught him to do. And I thought it was beautiful and very non-traditional. Um, Gato Mighty, uh, <laughs> Jess Dominguez, uh, the inside joke is, is that, that is whenever, whenever his father would get angry, he'd say, Gato Mighty. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, <laughs> This was Jess's way of uh, very cool. remembering him. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I want to share with you a classroom assignment that I've been utilizing for the past 25 years uh, in courses in American studies, uh, ethnic studies, and Chicana Chicano studies. Um, and after being asked to do this, because I was having some challenges with this title. Um, I, I, I came to, what I took away from it was, in reflecting on this work, uh, so much of it has been about acknowledging and affirming uh, racial, ethnic, gender, queer, immigrant, marginalized identities for my students and the communities that they represent. Um, an assignment that requires the actual arranging and organizing of memory and imagination within a box. That I've come to name as cajitas or sacred boxes. And Dr. Tillis made reference to a publication back in, I don't remember the year, <laughs> a long time ago. And cajitas draw from the collective conceptions of collaborations of the creative spirit of students that are publicly displayed, uh, at least when I first began this, around the Adams Muertos. So when Dr. Mercado asked me for this presentation, I started to put all this together. It was really interesting because in this 25 year trajectory, it's gone through a lot of changes, and it's interesting, again, to have the opportunity to put this together. I was, I was actually looking at slides, and we have a machine downstairs that actually makes them into images, which was really fantastic. About 25 years ago, uh, I was a professor of American Studies at Arizona State, and uh, alongside with a colleague, Santos Vega, um, at the Hispanic Research Center, we started to explore um, the range of expressions coming out of the Chicano-Mexicano migrant community that people had boxes to transport goods, cajitas. And you see them when they're sort of like for religious imagery. I um, usually put saints in these. And then just crates. Uh, in an effort to preserve cultural and sacred expressions and identities in response to uh, transitory uh, existence and movement and crossing borders. These self-contained wooden boxes or crates were home to their life possessions, such as family photographs, documents, prayer cards, and religious saints that accompanied them while traversing regional, national, and international boundaries. Um, they served the important purpose of providing personal meaning and orientation within you and familiar spaces. So um, what was important to me about the cajitas is they revealed a community of memory that through the art of reflection and remembering built an affirmed community. Uh, so this idea, as I talked with Dr. Vega about it, uh, led me to introduce this, what I call the cajita custom and practice into my class. And over time, cajitas, uh, cajita making in my classroom became a practice and expression that was translated into a contemplative teaching pedagogy where students created a material map guiding them towards the original source of their identity, where they recognized and honored the truest sense of their culture, history, and life experiences. And I thank uh, my colleague Laura Rendon for this idea. Uh, Laura is a retired educator um, uh, from UTSA. And years ago when I was doing this, I, was, I didn't know what I was doing, I was doing it. And she pulled me aside and asked if she could interview me and my students. And uh, fine, and was it this practice? And next thing I knew, I was a chapter in her book. Um, and it was a book entitled Senti Pensante, which is an important book around uh, not only educating the heart, but the mind. And so she kept on saying to me, Alberto, you're doing contemplative work. And I'm saying, what is that? And so, you know, just kept on thinking about it, thinking about it. And so I'm at the point now in the journey where um, I'm trying to do it in a more uh, meaningful way and in a much more uh, pur purposeful way. And so um, uh, she had 14 case studies in that book, and I was, I'm one of the chapters in there. So, um, so initially, uh, this Cajita project began in conjunction with Day of the Dead, celebrations through courses that I taught, like I said, American Ethnic Studies, 
American Studies, Chicano Studies, and at mainly uh, four campuses, ASU, uh, UC Santa Barbara, at Brown University, and then here. And the objective was to introduce and integrate culturally and historically rooted community practices and knowledge into higher education as understood and created by students. This led to the creation of a community-based celebration within a university setting where students, faculty, and staff, along with community members, were brought together to observe and celebrate the Dia de los Muertos through this practice of cajita making. Uh, and participants were invited to remember deceased family members, ancestors, and friends. And it was a semester-long project, and it was not in a course in art, it was a course in Chicano studies. And uh, this essay that I wrote, I, I began by talking about the fact that all of us are artists, and that in the process of that work, um, this is what I was doing with students. Um, cajitas were created and material memories of loved ones were publicly displayed for all to encounter and engage. Uh, campus-wide events. Uh, let me just mention quickly, B was a former student. This was her daughter, and this was uh, the mom and grandmother. And I remember this project very beautifully because she had put a hot cup of coffee out uh, in honor of her mother, and it was so real in terms of the work that was being done. Um, El Dia de los Muertos featuring the display of all cajita maker and practitioners organized as part of an annual celebration along with a one-page narrative authored by the cajita maker. Participants were invited to stand next to their sacred box and exchange stories and make personal connections with all who took part in the celebration. I have several pictures. This young man um, never met his dad and he found out that his father was a musician and so he got the guitar case, found some newspaper articles about his father and then had Richie Valens in there as a way to sort of remember and to bring recognition to his father. It was a common occurrence to construct and install a large community altar as part of our annual celebration that culminated in a presentation by a guest speaker along with foods and drinks for all to partake. Over the years, the celebration proved to be quite memorable and students and community members were able to come together to share about their family history, culture, and ways that were groundbreaking within a higher education setting. Hence, an academic space would be transformed into community space where relevant knowledge and uh, new ways of knowing would be affirmed along with emotions tied to personal identity were recognized. And that comes straight out of ethnic studies pedagogy and ethnic studies epistemology. Uh, as a result of the uh, participants and their memories that were on display, the annual day of the death celebration began to provide a, a venue to explore and express issues of social justice and more progressive and political perspectives. So when this first started, that really wasn't an intention. Uh, but that began to happen. This cajita was gorgeous. This woman was uh, half indigenous and half Chicana, and she made that by hand. And I had that for many, many years. And one year I just couldn't, I just had to give it away to another colleague, and I regret that I did that. But it's a beautiful box. The altar students. In the late 1990s, while at Arizona State University, we connected Dia de los Muertos with the numerous deaths along the U.S.-Mexico border, the countless individuals who died during their attempt to successfully traverse the challenging de desert of Arizona as they sought refuge and support in the U.S. were highlighted. Suddenly, remembering became an act of resistance. As many contemplated the daily struggles of migrants and peregrinos, it drew many participants to become mindful of inhumane actions sanctioned by the U.S. government towards fellow human beings that influenced students to link the personal with the political in the creation of their cajitas. As an experience that touched the lives of many students, many of them spoke directly and personally about their encounter with migration in their lives and the lives of their families. This perspective was reinforced by a class deciding to display a large map of the Arizona desert while during our community celebration where we plotted the hundreds of migrants who perished during the trek north. So we had this on a really large altar uh, and we had pinpointed very important areas. Um, It featured uh, Cells, Arizona, which is right there in that sort of pink area, defined as the deadliest corridor in all the United States. In addition, we invited the writer, uh, the writer uh, Luis Martin, uh, Manuel Luis Martinez to share his novel, Crossing, to underscore this tragedy, a book based on the deaths of migrants who suffocated in a railroad boxcar documented in the case of Sierra Blanca, Texas in 1998. After that year, I went to Santa Barbara, and uh, I was a visiting professor in uh, the Department of Religious Studies and uh, as a, a fellow at the Chicano Chicano Studies Research Center. 
And I taught a really great course that I've never taught again before. It's called The History of Religions of Aslan. And uh, we coordinate, we, 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 we had the course and we coordinated a national conference on Latino religion. And so the students uh, were just outstanding. Personal and political narratives that spoke to students about death. Uh, they spoke about work, indig indigeneity, sexuality, spirituality, healing, gender. And just the students did some incredible work. These were actually slides, and I had to convert them. Um, you can see, remember Pete Wilson? You can see him upside down there in that candle. <laughs> uh, this was the, the daughter of a curandera, the power of corn. This young lady's mother was a cannery worker in Watsonville. And so in honor of the mom, she had the crate and then, of course, the famous Alma Lopez piece in the middle, and then the use of the cans. It was just a gorgeous altar. And she had done it in such a beautiful way. And of course, this is not a person that's deceased. So by this time, we weren't really dealing, all subjects were not dealing with, with, with the dead, but we were dealing with just recognition of the community. This issue dealt with death. This one as well, newspaper articles. In 2001, my students and I organized the Dia de los Muertos celebration that recognized the ta tragic occurrence of 9-11 in New York City. And that compelled me and my students at Brown University to bring recognition to the more than 100 delivery drivers, waiters, cleaners who perished as a result of this tragedy, but were never recognized by the master narrative of the media and the powers that, and the powers that be due to their legal status. So they were systematically erased from this watershed event in US history. After much reflection and contemplation, we chose to erect a replica of the Twin Towers, which sadly enough, I do not have pictures of that, of, the, of that year, and pay tribute to those who had died alongside the bankers and the financiers in our desire and action to provide them with equal recognition in death, and in essence, to write them their existence and contributions uh, back into history. For the uh, past nine years, my Cajita project has taken me more into an area of contemplative studies. And it's really interesting because that's happened on this campus and that would be another sort of self-analysis for me to reflect on why, but um, I don't know, maybe because I'm getting older, I don't know, but it's interesting. Um, and so one of the, one of the um, desires from many people who read my first essay was they were after me to create sort of a guideline or like a how-to page and um, um, thanks to some colleagues here and some important conversations, I've actually done that. I'm in the process of putting that together into an essay. And this is just a brief uh, synopsis of it. And the, the idea then for the cajita making from a contemplative narrative, from a contemplative perspective, is of course the creation of the box is the first to recall, uh, the practice of recalling, the practice of reflection, uh, the practice of an inhabitation through the reflexive and creative action of cajita making. And this understanding has allowed me to speak about the needs to understand contemplation and mindfulness as an intergenerational practice that is situated within a social and political context. And so this has been kind of the work I've been doing recently with students. And I have to tell you, one of the reasons I've become more shy about the cajita making project is because at the end of the semester, I end up with 30 boxes. <laughs> and, and, I, and I say that in a very respectful way because they're such beautiful works. And I try to get students to take them back. They don't take them back, and so I end up with them, and I don't know what to do with them. It's really hard for me to throw them away. So it's a very challenging sort of issues. Um, last year, as part of a, as part of a uh, uh, campus compact conference we had here, I used this method in terms of doing the murals at Chicano Park, and we picked out very specific murals dealing with these issues around death and dying and issues related to some of the political issues uh, of the park in terms of getting people to walk the earth and to actually spend time with the mural and reflecting on it and then at the end have people do some more personal reflection on their own. So I have some examples of that from my more uh, recently young lady from Santa Barbara who is Chicana but has some Spanish um, practices, and again, same idea, narrative. A young lady from Corpus Christi. 
This young lady is from Puerto Rico, and uh, this was in honor of her grandfather, and she uses a suitcase as a way to speak about having to travel. But her connection to Frankenstein is because she always felt very marginalized, and she could connect with monsters, because monsters are always seen as deviant and outsiders. And so it was a really interesting narrative that she wrote about with regards to that issue, and her love for her dog. I love the, the, the graduation cap as a cajita. Beautiful, uh, first generation grad. Young man, uh, just the dualities that people have been speaking about. Now, I wanna share with you a, a little bit of text that would give you more insight into sort of the work that's being done now here. This was a young woman with uh, roots in Mallorca, and this was a class on the border so in the work that they were doing, they had to reflect on what this meant in terms of living in the borderlands and the work that was doing. I'll let you look at the text here. I'm going to look at it quickly. And again, it was a semester-long project and incorporating this sense of recall and reflect and inhabit. It was something we would do as often as possible in class. It was not easy to do, but it was something we did. And probably one of my most powerful ones is this one. This is a suitcase with some letters. Chicago bears uh, Jersey flowers. And I'll let you read the text on this one. Briefly, I wish to draw our attention to how the public displays of death quickly become politicized when it comes to the Chicana or Chicano community and in two very significant historical moments. And I just needed to speak about this because I think it's tied so much to our topic around the politicization, the politicization of death and what impact it has on our community. And the first one with the, the death of Selena Quintanilla and, uh, and the second being the massacre in El Paso, which we just recently experienced. On March 31st, 1995, Serena Quintanilla was fatally shot and killed by the former president of her fan club. Thousands upon thousands of fans publicly mourned her life, including the nearly 50,000 that filed past her casket at Bayfront Auditorium in Corpus Christi. Such personal expressions within public space did not go unnoticed by the mainstream. On the morning of Selena's burial, Howard Stern played Selena's music accompanied by the sounds of gunfire while he parodied with an attempted Spanish accent the thousands of weeping mourners and announced, Spanish people have the worst taste in music. They have no depth. Selena's music is awful. I don't know what you can say. You can't, they can't, you can't grow crops. You, can't, you, you got a cardboard house. Your 11-year-old daughter is a prostitute. This is music to perform abortions to. And so therefore then you had the outcry from the Latino community here it wasn't all that effective, but I think that the statement around Stern and the statement on the death of Selena in terms of it being a popular and communal and public expression really rubbed people the wrong way. And I remember very well that uh, when Selena died, uh, People magazine chose not to put her on the front cover throughout the United States, but she was only put on the front cover of the magazine in the Southwest. This was very interesting, the way these whole things kind of ended up playing themselves out. Two months ago, we saw a major public display of grief that was tied directly to race in the city of El Paso, when Patrick Crucius killed 20 and wounded 26 in the local Walmart. His actions were tied directly to his racist rant entitled The Inconvenient Truth rallying against the dangers of mass immigration, warning that Mexicans would eventually take over the economy and government, Crucius proclaimed that the time had come, quote, to attack low security targets in order to fight and reclaim my country from destruction. So public display of grief in the city of El Paso became public display of community affirmation and resistance from this Mexican and transfronterizo by national community. So I just have one closing thought, and it, it ties a little bit to 
what we've been saying here. I, I wanted to close by drawing attention to the insights put forth by the scholar of religion, David Carrasco, and he recognizes the power of resistance coming from colonized groups such as indigenous in Mexico. But what's interesting about his work, he reminds me that we must recognize, he reminds us that we must recognize indigenous traditions post-colonizations as what he calls double entendres. Uh, the word syncretism was mentioned. I, I prefer the term double entendre expression. It comes from Anis Nandi's work. And that the systematic destructions of people have brought forth the invention and reinscription of modified religious practices such as El Dia de los Muertos. So those things that have, cho have been chosen to destroy our communities in many ways have been reimagined re and reinvented. I think the Dia de los Muertos would be one. The Virgen de Guadalupe would be another one in terms of how you take these images as a way to, as a tool for destroying communities, but then Day of the Dead resurges and now you have it everywhere. And you know, this weekend at Chicano Park and, and Sherman Heights are very good examples of that. Uh, so he calls it uh, the practice of world renewing, where traditions and practice are regenerated and adapted to new contexts and political situations. So you know, when you look at this long history, when you look at this pre-Columbian practice, that now finds itself in San Diego in 2019. It's pretty phenomenal. So I'll end on that. Thank you for your time. practice of mindfulness as a way of doing education is something that probably is very foreign to us in this country, and how um, you can begin to recognize the importance of that and being very intentional in your practices, I think that's important. Uh, I think there's some real problems with it because you're drawing from traditions that uh, are very different and very unique and they're trying to be applied to higher ed and that's gone kind of crazy in certain sectors. Um, but um, um, for me, uh, what, I, what I am attracted to is the fact that um, in the process of, of education and it's the work of Galeano who then was borrowed by, 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 uh, by uh, uh, Rendon, is that we're very good in education to educate the mind, but we do very little to educate the heart. Mm -hmm. And so then it goes into questions of emotive practices and recognizing the value of that. And I think for communities of color, and I think for like Chicanos at this campus, you have students who are dealing with a lot of disjunctures. And so how do you bring those worlds together? And I've noticed that to work very effectively with this kind of project. So that's what I'm sort of getting at. So, I heard three interpretations of Dia de los Muertos. Um, I really liked Alberto de Tablantan. I really liked the kind of political inscription of the Avalos. Regina, I heard in yours elements of Dia de los Muertos being um, recuperated by the cultural industry that is becoming a fairly omnipresent and therefore commercialized product. Uh, did I hear you right? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Can you reflect on that? That's a really good question that I asked the people that I interviewed. I asked the Chicana and Chicano artists I interviewed. I asked community people, um, Mexicanos here. and and got different answers. And so I try to show that in the book, the different ways people see this. Some people think of it as, as a negative thing. Others feel that through the commercialization, it has really spread the holiday and helped a lot of people to learn about it. So a movie like Coco, now you know millions of children uh, have a better understanding of what Dia de los Muertos is. Um, and you know even when you have the different cartoons that t children watch, um, you know, Dora the Explorer, uh, you know, things like this, it brings visibility to it. Of course, there's also the, the danger that things get distorted when they are commercialized in some ways, and 
So then, you know, w one of the things I heard a lot from Chicana bilingual teachers who I spoke to was that they felt that's, that's the role of events like this to do the education, to continue. They said the work of, of they were saying, speaking on behalf of Chicanos and Chicanos, they were like, our work is to continue to educate and to make sure that people are learning what, what the purpose, what the intention of this tradition is. So it does not get confused and get labeled as some kind of Mexican Halloween or just a time to drink and have a crazy party. So that's, that's ongoing work that we can do as artists and educators and just people who love the tradition. That was my question, the same question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as you know, I organized this, uh, uh, I started to organize the Dia de los Muertos events in, uh, actually with the Frente Indígena a long time ago in Oceanside, and with uh, Regina also in the UCSD, and it always, you always run the risk to, especially in academic endeavors, to folklorize yourself, especially me, with an accent coming from Mexico, you know, this is folkloric, but uh, it is, uh, I have actually taken on doing these uh, with the help of, of a lot of people in the university, like the director of the Humanities Center or Dean, uh, the support of my colleagues as well, uh, Kristen Moran, who's here, who, uh, to, to explain this, right? This is so complex. It comes from indigenous roots and it comes, it has journalism in it. Sometimes people ask me, but it is, what about communication? There is nothing communicative about this, right? Or nothing to do with communication studies. But we do, I see those, those links very clearly. But uh, how do you, you just said that we have to do this. We have to open these spaces to educate ourselves and to educate others and in some ways uh, pass on the tradition. Um, I was, while building the altars here and in, in the SLP this morning, uh, there were some students coming in bringing some uh, butterflies for immigrants in the border, right? Uh, they, they were commemorating, uh, the, they were rem reminding the people about people who have died of violence in the border. This is a very journalistic task. And they were setting them up in the, in the main altar. And they were talking to Luz, who, Luz Rodriguez, who's one of our speakers from Oaxaca, who just stepped out. And they were connecting, right? This is, it is important to have those spaces to talk about the, something that is so complex. It is commercial, yes, but it's ancient, yes. It is uh, spiritual, yes. So having a point of entry is important. My question ultimately for the panel will be how to communicate this complexity, right? Um, it is not good or bad. It is not, oh, this is the other los muertos. It is so complex. So how to communicate that? Mm -hmm. to make people interested in learning more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm reminded of a, of a conversation I had with a Oaxacan man. He was, he was um, a Mixteco, and he had been living in Oceanside for about 30 years. At the time I had interviewed him, he was one of the early people to come and settle in that area. And by the time I interviewed him, there was a larger Oaxacan community there. And he had, he, um, he had, was very active in the celebration. And at the time I interviewed him, which I think was around 2004, the Oceanside had, had just recently started these, these if, if any of you ever been to the Oceanside Day of the Dead celebration, it's a, it's, at the time it was a weekend long celebration. They blocked off the streets. They had 25 altars. I think they still do a really big celebration um, there. And so, thank you. Um, but so what he said to me when I said, so what do you think about, you know, because I first interviewed the organizer of the celebration. She was from the Oceanside tourism um, bureau. She was an Anglo woman and she was talking about how for her this had been a, she really seemed, she, she loved the tradition but she's like it's also been really great for tourism. We're trying to get tourists to come to Oceanside. We need economic development. We need more, you know, downtown stores and shops and restaurants and this kind of festival is part of our year-long efforts to bring people to Oceanside. So she was seeing it more economic but she was also saying but what I love about it she said was you know you've got the Girl Scouts coming in and you've got the, um, the people 
PTA and then the Oaxacan communities and the church, the Catholic community. And she was saying it was a real community building thing. So I asked Jose, you know, as a, as a Oaxacan man, you know, so what do you think about this celebration? Because there's these flyers, uh, posters all over the city, you know, and there's these banners across the street that say, you know, Oceanside Day of the Dead Festival. And there's music and bands and it's on the radio and, you know, all this stuff. And, and, and the people were selling all kinds of T-shirts, you know, Day of the Dead T-shirts and calaveras and, and you know, all kinds of stuff, you know. And I said, so, so what are your thoughts on this, on it getting uh, commercialized and sort of becoming this popular thing that tourists come to the city for? And he said to me, you know, I've been living here for 30 years, and when I first came here, I celebrated it by myself in my house, and I celebrated it quietly. And when other Oaxacans came, each one of them was celebrating it quietly in their house, and we didn't talk about it outside of the community. We did not feel safe or we were afraid to even let people know this is something we did. But at, with the celebration that the city's having, they invited all of us to, to, lead, to lead it and, and to, to teach about it and to have these altars in the city. You see like 25 altars in the streets and they have a beautiful procession and they brought um, bands from Oaxaca to march in the procession and they were bands from the villages of the people from the community. And so he said, for us, this has been something beautiful because it gives us this space. Yes, it's also being, it's part of tourism and it's, it's being commercialized, but it's also giving me a way that my daughter, who his, his daughter was in elementary school, and you know, my daughter can see that this is something that is really largely admired and, and, and valued and that I can celebrate it and my community can celebrate it in a very proud public way now that wasn't the, the case when I first moved here. So a lot of comments like that, that I interviewed so many people that, you know, I definitely had people who also were like, no, this is terrible. But I do think that even something like commercialization is not black and white and there are always both positive and negative things, you know, even something like, let's say Christmas, there are some people who say, oh my God, it's all commercialized, it's all money and spending. But those people who really are celebrating the birth of Christ and, you know, doing what they do as a family, those that, that's still happening, right? At the same time that we have all this other stuff happening. So it's not really a simple yeah. answer. No, it's so we are out of time. <laughs> um, but maybe our panelists will stay here if we still have questions, but thank you everyone for showing up. Thank you. Thank you.